This brings us at long last to Charles Darwin. Born February 12, 1809, the exact same day and date as Abraham Lincoln. As a youth, Darwin loved to explore nature around his family home in Shrewsbury, England. His father and grandfather were both physicians, and it was presumed that he would follow in their footsteps. He was sent to Cambridge to begin his medical training, but on witnessing unanesthetized surgery, he decided, no thank you please, and changed his major to theology. But all the while, he continued to take courses in natural history, botany, entomology, etc. On completing his degree, he managed to secure a position on an ocean-going voyage. His position on HMS Beagle was as a companion to the ship's captain and as a naturalist. The voyage of the Beagle was a five-year trip around the world, which, as you can imagine, was quite influential on young Darwin's thinking about the natural world. On his return to England, he wrote up his notes in a travel log in his first book, Voyage of the Beagle. He also turned his attention to the question of the origin of species. He knew the idea was controversial, so he wanted to confirm his observations with experimentation as much as he could. He wrote letters and spoke with eminent naturalists to get their opinions. His plan was to research as much as he could and publish after his death. But something came up that inspired him to publish while still alive, as we saw back in the first few slides. Though Darwin's great boat trip was famous for its stopover in the Galapagos Islands, as you can see in this map, that was just a small part of a much greater adventure. The ocean-going part of the voyage of the Beagle was most unpleasant for Darwin, his land adventures were the more interesting part for him, and he collected plant and animal specimens wherever he stopped over, and sent them back to England for identification, and often for description as species new to science. While Lamarck considered the use and disuse to be the crucial driver for change in a species, Darwin saw adaptation to the environment to be necessary to, for new species to form. The most famous of his observations were the Galapagos finches. He collected birds from several of the islands and noted that they seemed to be similar to finches he collected on the South American continent. The Galapagos finches were also superficially similar in plumage and other characteristics, but very different in their beak shape and their diet. In this slide, we see three different species of finches from the Galapagos Islands. Each has a very different and specialized diet. A cactus eater, an insect eater, and a seed eater. The beaks of these birds are different. The cactus eater's beak is moderately broad and long, which enables it to eat a variety of the parts of the plant, including nectar, flowers, and an occasional insect. Kind of an all-purpose beak. The insect eater has more of a specialist beak. Longer and narrower, like a pair of forceps for getting into small spaces and collecting those insects. Seeds are another matter. Many of the plants in the Galapagos Islands have thick seed coats that are tough to crack open to get at the nutrition inside. Seed-eating birds need to have short and stout beaks, like a pair of pliers, to get the seeds open. Darwin saw these different types of birds, and there are several other species, as having shared common ancestry, which explains their similarities, but that different diets led to adaptation, forming the birds into diverse species. In 1844, Darwin wrote an essay, sort of an early short first draft for Origin of Species, where he first described the idea he is most famous for, natural selection. He didn't broadcast the ideas as he felt they were too controversial and without convincing proof. So he was well on his way to collecting more data and dying before publication so as to avoid the heat. But the main thesis was there. Natural selection allows individuals with more favorable, heritable traits to survive and reproduce. Darwin's plans to die in relative comfort, he lived out his days racked by tropical diseases contracted aboard the Beagle, were derailed by the Postal Service, which brought him a manuscript postmarked from the Malay Archipelago from young Alfred Russell Wallace. 
Wallace wanted him to Darwin to take a look-see before passing the manuscript on for widespread publication. Darwin was staggered to find that the ideas in the manuscript were very similar to his own. This prompted Darwin to wrap up his own manuscript and publish it, dead or alive. Darwin's magnum opus, first published in 1859, included substantially more data than the 1844 essay, though the work explained the unity of life, the diversity of life, and why organisms are so well suited to the habitats in which they are found. In Origin of Species, Darwin never calls his idea evolution. Rather, he refers to it as descent with modification. Living things share common features because of shared common ancestry and the different environmental conditions throughout the biosphere led to changes over long periods of time, thousands or millions of years. In his journals, he made a drawing that depicted his vision of descent with modification. I think, he said, tree. He viewed the history of life on Earth as being like a tree, with the branches representing diversification. This idea meshed well with Linnaeus's nested hierarchy, groups of species forming genera, groups of genera sharing a common family, and so on. This tree model, called a phylogeny, can be applied to any named group of organisms, any taxon. For example, we can model the evolutionary relationships between the three domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Archaea and eukaryotes share more recent common ancestry with each other than either do with bacteria. Within the eukaryotes, we can still apply tree thinking to the different lineages of the nucleated cell creatures. Again, animals and fungi share a narrow branch, and the plants, green algae and red algae, also share a branch. Notice that all of these eukaryotes are connected, sharing a single common nucleated ancestor, but through descent with modification, we have lineages that photosynthesize and those that do not. Or, just within a single branch of the animal phylogeny, we can infer relationships between three different mammals, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. These other branches can be filled with other mammals of the order carnivora, Hopefully, you can see the usefulness of such a diagram that is frequently used today. Here's another example of just such a phylogeny showing the evolutionary history of the proboscoidea, known to most people as the elephants. The branching of the tree can be used to measure divergence over time, as you can see here on the x-axis down here. Today, there are only three extant or still living representatives in the elephant lineage, two species of African elephant and the Asian elephant. Also on the tree are links to the other still living relatives of elephants, manatees and hyraxes, though their paths diverged from the elephants around 60 million years ago. Between then and now, many different transitional species lived and died, the nose got progressively longer, and animals got progressively larger. There were a number of other transitional species with some interesting variation in the dentition, or the arrangement of the teeth. These transitional forms are not just hypothesized ancestors. We know of these weird cousins from the Bammer family reunion from fossilized remains. Darwin's mechanism for evolution, by means of natural selection, can be distilled down to two observations and two inferences. His first observation was that members of a population vary in heritable traits. For example, these ladybugs, which are really a type of beetles, are different shades of red and orange. Some have large or more black spots. Some smaller and fewer. This variation is caused by genetic differences, different alleles. His second observation, all species are biologically able to produce more offspring than the environment can sustain. Many of these offspring are fated to die. In other words, organisms' reproductive potential, how many offspring they are capable of producing, is greater than the environment can sustain. In this image, this purple tree is a jacaranda. 
The purple is thousands upon thousands of flowers. Beautiful, yes, but the function of these flowers is to produce the next generation of jacaranda trees. Each fertilized flower will produce a seed pod that may have around 10 or 20 seeds. Now, not all of the flowers will be pollinated because there aren't enough pollinators. That is environmental limitation. And not all of those pollinated flowers will produce seeds. And not all of those seeds will go on to produce new jacaranda trees. If there weren't environmental limitations, there wouldn't be room for any other plants on the planet because they would all be jacarandas. These two observations led him to two inferences. The first inference was that individuals whose inherited traits give them a higher probability of surviving and reproducing in a given environment will leave more offspring than individuals without those traits. Or to put it another way, more fit individuals will leave more offspring. Now, in this context, fitness doesn't mean necessarily stronger or more muscly. Fitness in evolutionary terms is the ability to survive and to reproduce. Fit individuals will leave more offspring. The second inference was that the unequal ability of individuals to survive and reproduce will lead to the accumulation of favorable traits in the population over generations. In other words, over time, a population will change to match its environment, or a population will become more fit. Taken together, these two observations and two inferences form the core of Darwin's thesis on the origin of species. One more time. Individuals with favorable heritable traits are more fit and will leave more offspring than others. Fitness is defined in part by the environment. What defines fitness for a blue whale is not the same as what defines fitness for a gerbil. Also, changes in the environment will change what constitutes fitness. For example, a warming climate. A couple of important points. Very important points. While we as individuals grow and develop and change, that is not evolution by natural selection. Evolution acts upon populations. Natural selection is non-random. Selection implies non-randomness. Drawing cards from a face-down deck is random. Removing the queens from a deck of cards is not. It is selection. Keeping with this analogy, natural selection can only act upon heritable traits that exist in a population, increasing or decreasing those traits. We can't just add or subtract 15s from a deck of cards. Only values that exist, aces, twos, sevens, jacks, etc. And what is a favorable heritable characteristic will depend on the environment. Just like hearts may be valuable to have in your hand in a game of hearts, Hoarding hearts isn't going to help you win a game of solitaire.